Good to go with the recording. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It is great to have you here today with us as we dive into the food industry and the necessary changes that are upon us. I want to give a huge thank you for the partners that made this event happen. Yara Simoni, Food Tech Manager at the Israel Export Institute. Laura Jenkins, Director of Partnerships at Global SF. We'll be sharing a few words later on. Our counterparts in the New York office. And of course, our dear speakers and participants and participating companies for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. Before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. We are eager to have you join the conversation. So please raise your hand to speak and you can unmute yourself. If you're shy, you're more than welcome to send us a question in the chat and we would raise the question on your behalf. Right now, everybody's muted. You are able to unmute yourself, but please don't do that before you type in the chat or raise your hand so we can make sure we don't have any background noises disrupting the session. For those new faces in the crowd, my name is Ray Roth. I am the Director of Innovation and Business Development at the Israel Economic Mission San Francisco. We have four missions in the US. We have a New York office, DC office, and Texas as we work to support trade between the US and Israel. Our mission is to help our local network, that's you, access Israeli innovation across all industries. Please use us as a resource, whether you're looking for specific solutions or just wanting to discover what's new in your field. Now, like many other industries, the pandemic has pointed out weaknesses in the daily operation and management of the food supply chain. Inability to access global supply chain brought a resilience and a reliance on farm to table services. Changes in product demand raised the need for a real time demand and supply tracking system for better allocation of produce, not to mention the growing percentage of food waste estimated at $1 trillion each year. We have a great lineup of speakers today sharing insights from their global experience and a highly skillful audience tuning in. Please mind that we created this event as a meeting setup so you can all participate. I invite you to join the conversation and share your feedback and know-how with us. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our partner in this event, Laura Jenkins, Director of Partnerships at Global SF, to say a few words. Laura, the stage is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited about today's program, and thank you, Ray, for your introduction. As Ray mentioned, I'm Laura Jenkins. I'm the Director of Partnerships at Global SF. And I want to um, extend my thanks to Moran and Ray with the Israel Economic Mission to the West Coast, as well as the Israel Export Institute for your partnership in hosting this unique opportunity to connect innovation between Israel and San Francisco virtually. Um, I'll be brief because I know we're all anxious to jump into learning more about what the future holds in terms of food tech challenges, solutions, and innovation in Israel and the Bay Area. For background, Global SF is a 501c3 nonprofit with three regional initiatives, China SF, Latin SF, and SF Asia, um, which are public-private partnerships with the city of San Francisco, um, and we support economic relations and partnerships at the global level. So we also partner with the state of California and we're here to support entrepreneurs, companies, funds, investment from around the world expanding to the Bay Area. And we also help companies already based here to expand globally. So we are helping companies at different stages to expand their international operations and make introductions to the right partners free of charge. Um, so our team is here to support you and your success. And we partner with the Israel Economic Mission to the West Coast and trusted partners here in San Francisco to make that happen. Which brings me to our first keynote speaker, Manuel Gonzalez, who is the founder and managing partner of Global Riff, the Revolution in Food Fund. Based here in San Francisco, Global Riff is an integrated innovation and investment platform that seeks to discover, invest, and develop founders leading the revolution in food, which is all of you. So Manuel has decades of experience in food innovation and was previously managing director and global head of startup innovation for Rabobank. He founded Food Bites and Terra franchises 
and he is on the advisory boards for AgFunder as well as MISTA, another partner of Global SF, and a food innovation ecosystem and optimizer, as they say. So more than an incubator or an accelerator, they are working with startups and established corporates to optimize ideas, products, people, and investments. So with that, I welcome Manuel. Hello, Laura. Thank you very much for um, the very kind words. And uh, let me start uh, by sharing my screen very quickly so I can start talking to you about uh, the topic. So let's see. I think this is it. So I'm not going to talk about me because you already did. Um, so yes, many, many years in, in food in, in Rabobank, uh, in Mexico, here in the U.S., and now, you know, creating my own thing in, in Riff. So you already spoke about venture capital and, and what we do with companies. Uh, you know, we're, we're a very young firm, so very soon we're going to start investing, so stay tuned. And I was invited to talk about um, food safety and supply chain um, waste in light of COVID, and, and I will, and, and you will see some of the numbers that I think you already have heard and, and know about, but are actually three things I really want to talk about, and that is fortitude, stoicism, and love of community. So let's, let's dive into it. Um, so this is the thing, and this is the reality. You know, there has never been a time in history where we have produced so much food, much more food than we can consume, but, one third of the global production is lost or wasted. And 880 million people approximately face starvation every day. So food is growing more expensive because of a bundle supply chains and things like currency devaluation, despite the abundant supply. And a tenth of the world goes hungry. And this is before COVID. So let's see what happened with COVID and by the numbers. Very simple. So 132 million more people than previously projected could go hungry. 909 million undernourished people, I guess, you know, the, the pre-COVID number of 830, 40 million. So that means 12,000 people could die every day from hunger. And, you know, women and girls, of course, you know, gender inequality make it 60% of the population facing chronic hunger. So how is the U.S. doing? Is the U.S. doing any better than this? Let's see. The numbers. GDP growth annualized Q2 was minus 32.9%. And consumption, business investment, residential investment, it, it all take a hit, uh, more or less same orders of magnitude. And this is despite spending, government spending rising by 17.4%. However, food retail was up 12.8%. You know, food is food. Uh, through all these years and, you know, being from Mexico, spending a lot of time in adventure markets, I've seen a lot of crisis. Food always does well because, well, we eat, right? We, we, we need to stay alive. So food is always a very resilient uh, sector. Food services, of course, uh, restaurants did take a, a just a, an amazing, incredible hit. 52% drop in April. It did improve a little bit. Um, the, the, in May, June, July, because of um, the stimulus payments, but that is ending, so we will see what happens. Uh, it's, you know, food service, already a very hard business, it's only getting harder. And this was, you see in this graph, more or less the image of, you know, the, the, the downturn and recovery. And when you see the dotted line, the dotted line is the first, projection. And then the solid line in green, it was the projection more or less in May. So you see there minus 25% more or less. So it was worse than the, the, the worst projection. We are not going to recover in Q3, but you know, models are usually wrong. What's, what's important is to look at what the image looks like. Uh, now, if you see, when you look at the magnitude, it is important to understand that when you see things coming back, it doesn't mean it comes back as the way it was before COVID. It is gonna take time to go back to before COVID, but you know, things get better when, I don't know. 
but this is more or less how you know the image looks like but what about food big difference so food and beverage us you know it's always does a lot better than the rest very resilient it's a good place to be pet services also other you know other services did better are doing better will continue to do better so that's food now as i was saying you know there we produce more than enough calories to meet every individual's needs according to the u the fao I think we produce enough to give something like 2,200 calories to every individual on earth. But there are increasing levels of food insecurity, even in places that used to have relative stability. In the US, for example, more than 5 million people can't afford a healthy diet. And about a third of the people that today are relying on food banks are doing it for the first time. That's, that's big. So you see, waste, cost, and logistics really prevent food surplus from shift from where they are being produced to where they are needed, right? So we see here in California, you know, the fields are being, are being uh, uh, planted and harvested, but, um, you know, there's a complete imbalance. The, the problem with, with what happened in the food service was that a whole part of the market dropped. So even when there were people buying food, there was a whole part of the market and types of products that we're not going to food service. So for example, the potato that goes to food service isn't the same thing as the potato that goes to your house. It's a different potato. So, you know, those things, imbalances, imbalances. So costs are going up throughout the world for rich and for poor. How do we solve this? So let's look at history. And I'm going to be telling you a couple of stories and, and the way I see things. Hey, look at this. This is to 1918 and the pandemic outbreak of that time. If you look at um, you know, cities, the comparison of cities that had longer intervention and shorter inter intervention. Longer intervention is red, shorter is in gray. So not only you have lower mortality with higher intervention, but also after the pandemic, you had a higher employment gains. Now I'm a banker and I like to hedge. So whenever we were looking at things, and we saw that you could be wiped out by, hedge, by hedging, you would hedge. And call me crazy, but I don't want to die. I don't want to be exterminated. So when I think about masks, do they work, don't they work? Well, let's assume we don't know. But if they work, they can save my life or somebody else's life. If they don't work, they are an inconvenience. So the premium for inconvenience, survival. That seems to me a very good hedge. I think we should take it. So that you know, takes us to stoicism, fortitude, and love of community. All I need is to accept an inconvenience to hedge against death. Let's just think about that. Going back to how do we solve this? Innovation and technology. So we need to radically change how we produce, distribute, and consume food. We need to double food supplies and access over the next 30 years. We all seen those numbers without affecting the environment and making food nutritious and affordable. So we need an injection of capital that goes far beyond of what governments can do, what strategic and incumbents can do. But this is where venture capital, private equity, and all the, the institutional and personal investors can do. So we need to invest in technology and we need the regulatory impetus to use it. And here comes another story. So I was reading the Wall Street Journal because that's what bankers do. And um, there was this op-ed from a guy and the op-ed said, California is out to get you. And they were talking about, in, in, in particular, you know, the, the power outages we had recently because of, of uh, the, the heat and complaining about how California has been doing all this clean energy thing, blah, 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 and this is, and I go back to, you know, banker hedging, and I think, well, the climate models are probably wrong because models are always wrong, but that's not the point of models. The point of models is to understand risk, so then you hedge it. And when my risk is global extermination, I would say I need to hedge that risk. 
because again, call me crazy, I don't want to die. So what happens if my hedge just means that I'm going to have a few hot days during the year because I need new energy? I think that's pretty cool. I should do it. And it goes back to stoicism, fortitude, and love of community. Can I withstand a few really hot days? And I hated it. I am from Mexico. I don't like heat. I usually have air conditioning, but okay, you know, I wear just shorts and, you know, try to do certain things, go to the beach, whatever. But I think that's a pretty good catch. So these are the things that we're looking at. And when I look at the startups that are coming and, and here with, with, with the, um, the trade mission and, and everything, you see these things, upcycling, water usage, packaging, pollution, pesticides, robotics, all kinds of things that can be done to solve these things. And that's great. But I want to finish by telling you another story. And when you think about all this innovation and things that you're doing, my last story is about an ancient tribe. And I'm going to go back to the years when I was head of Rabobank in Mexico. And we were doing some work with some, um, some groups in southern Mexico, some, some native tribes, and working with them to maintain the jungle. And there were two groups, one the Chontal tribe, the other one was the Lacandon tribe. The Chontal tribe is a little bit more Western, if you want to put it that way, than the Lacandon. So the, the Chontals, they use cows as a store of value. So what does that mean? If somebody in the family gets sick or they need money, they sell a cow. That's what they do. So what we were helping them to do is to look at their jungle and look at the trees with precious wood and understand that that is actually their best store of value. So we were working with them in maintaining the jungle, you know, and recovering a lot of it and to understand what the value of the trees and how to manage a forest to make it economically viable so that you keep the jungle and keep the trees, but then also, you know, use it as, as, as a value, which is fine. It works. And they were loving it. There was a whole change in the community. It was very interesting to see. In the case of the Lacandon, it's a little bit different because the Lacandon hunt with bow and arrow. So for them, the jungle is not a store of value, but the way they, that's how they find their food, they hunt. And it was very interesting to see, you know, how they, they hunt birds and monkeys and jaguar is just incredible. And, and it's, it's pretty humbling for them. Uh, it was about maintaining the jungle for that, but they still needed a cash crop. But it couldn't be corn, because for corn, you need to burn the jungle so you can plant corn. So we were working with them and, and uh, you know, thinking about uh, shade coffee and fern, all the things that can grow under the canopy so they could have a cash crop. So what does this mean? Um, when you think about robotics and when you think about, you know, trees, yes, not, whatever, think about the communities and the consequences to them. You know, are we, when we're doing all this innovation, are we eliminating farmers? Are we eliminating the livelihood of communities? Are we, you know, what is the balance? animals, biodiversity, trees, furniture, I don't know. What is the balance? Let's think about community when we make changes. Let's think about these three things, stoicism, fortitude, and community as a way to solve all our challenges. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel, for this presentation. If we have any questions from the audience or if anybody wants to hop on and join the conversation, either ask Manuel questions or comment about the presentation, please type in the chat and feel free to unmute yourself. Um, hi, Amy Zeidelman here, I'm based in Philadelphia, um, co-founder and CEO of Zoom Foods. I was wondering if you could speak to the role of the consumer in all of this, you know, um, as a small food purveyor, working with manufacturers who ultimately work with the farmers and then the exporters. I mean, what can we do to 
persuade the consumer to buy into this to be able to move everything forward? You know, it's, it's, um, it's all about communication. And, you know, the, one big change that we experienced, I would say, over the last 15 years, more than, than any other time, was the change in the, the, the difference in the way in which, in which companies communicate with their consumer. You know, in the past, the way you, you used to communicate was TV, you know, print, uh, your packaging on retail. Social media has changed that and mm -hmm. actually leveled the playing field because smaller companies like yours had access to the place where consumers were listening. And that's what social media does. So communication and, and your communication strategy is really, really important. The attention market share. How do you earn that attention market share for a consumer? It is very difficult, um, very but it's way cheaper. Very expensive. <laughs> but, that, but that's the way. You need to, to find, you, need, you know, the number one thing you need to do is understand who your consumer is and where they are. How are you going to find them and how are you going to talk to them? And, and that's the key. And it is not simple, but I think many times companies spend a lot of time thinking about their product and not enough time thinking about how to talk to their consumer. And in the end, that's how you're going to sell. So you can have the best product, but maybe it doesn't sell because people didn't even know who you are and what you're about. Right. Well, I guess what I was referring to was uh, maybe collective opportunity for uh, larger corporations or larger groups of company to help, you know, um, inform consumers about why they should be making or maybe even paying more for products that are doing the community work that are doing the, you know, um, sustainability work on their supply chain. But maybe there's a future for more collaboration, you know, coming from the top. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, um, that's the activism side. Uh, you, in the end, you know, consumer votes with their wallets. Right. Sometimes they pay, sometimes they don't. Um, it's hard to tell, but, you know, when you think about alternative protein, the, the reality is that pay, people are paying more for, for a plant-based solution. And, and this is because uh, animal welfare has a very strong emotional um, influence in people. So it is very important that, that, you know, the emotional content of what you say is there. People need to really feel it. And that's, that's not easy. You need to find what that, where is that emotional? And yeah, I mean, if, if you come together as a group in your field, it is easier, but on the other hand, if you want to wait until big companies and strategics are behind you, maybe you should, you know, get a really good coffee and sit down. It doesn't happen that easily. So, so don't wait in my view. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Manuel. Our next speaker has over 25 years of experience in R&D production and global collaboration in the food tech arena. She has worked within startups in Israel, across the board in the food industry solutions, and now she's a part of the executive team at Fresh Start, a food innovation incubator based in Israel. Dr. Tami Meron is focused on promoting breakthrough technologies in order to bring global good industry solutions to its immediate and future needs. Tommy, the stage is yours. Thank you. Just want to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. So hello, everybody. Um, let's try to figure out what is so special about the Israeli food tech ecosystem and why are we considered as uh, worldwide pioneers in the food tech industry? Well, um, Israel has limited resources of land and water, and uh, it has been under continuous threat ever since it was incepted. So in order to survive, we had to be innovative, both in agriculture and then in the food processing. I will share with you two examples, two specific examples of Israel innovation from its early stage. One of them is the Teftefet, um, 
The Stafford is a water dripper, uh, dripping irrigation system that results in 70% increase of crop yields while saving 50% in water consumption. The, the company that was built based on this technology, Netafim, is considered nowadays one of the worldwide leading companies in uh, water irrigation uh, systems. Um, the first uh, Israeli food tech innovation uh, was, uh, was done also back in the 50s uh, when there was limited resources of rice in Israel. Um, and uh, our Prime Minister Ben Gurion uh, realized that a lot of immigrants arrived from different countries and they were used to eat rice and couscous. Uh, which was uh, limited at that time. So uh, it approached the Israeli uh, industry and uh, they actually developed the first uh, uh, rice alternative, which is also uh, being uh, presented today in, uh, in the US uh, in uh, well-known restaurants. So if we talk about uh, innovation in any, any field, um, the disruptive and deep technology arrives many times from the from the uh, academia. Sorry, I cannot see my screen. Just a minute. Okay, maybe this is better. Um, it arrives from the academia. Um, however, academia pe persons and also young entrepreneurs are typically inexperience in bringing a project or early project into the market. Um, as a PhD student at the Hebrew University, I've met brilliant professors that are fully dedicated to the research. And as a startup ex expert in building uh, technologies from the early stage of concept for the past 11 years, I've met with hundreds of industry and investment teams. And their focus is completely, completely different. The professor is looking and interested in findings and inventions that he can later on publish in a well, highly prestigious uh, uh, scientific journals, while the industry and investment teams, they are actually looking for good business opportunities. So, um, Israeli organizations such as Fresh Start Food Tech Incubator is capable to bridge the gap between an early project and the market opportunity. Fresh Start is intended to support more than 40 startups in order to bring the global industry next generation technological solutions. We are part of the Israel Innovation Authority Incubators Program and we have a unique syndicate representing the best of Israeli industry and the best of global VC. Uh, we guide the startups teams from a very early stage to bring them to the next stage, highly prepared in terms of uh, proof of concept, scale up, joint ventures, IP strategy, regulation, and of course, go to market strategy. Fresh Start uh, is part of a larger program led by the Israeli Ministry of Economy to create an agri-food cluster at the north of Israel. And of course, we are joining forces with our local uh, partners. Talking about the future of supply chain, waste reduction and food safety, especially in light of the COVID-19 that emphasized the need to be uh, able to control each step of the supply chain and be able to operate on a domestic level, we are talking about big data and AI solutions. Now, since uh, I saw the list of uh, startups that are going to speak uh, in a short while, since a lot of them are dealing with this uh, field of AI and uh, uh, big data collection, I'm going to highlight additional important issues um, in my speech. Um, if we are talking about supply chain, it doesn't matter if you arrive from the industry, if you are an entrepreneur or an investor, we all should be aware to the fact that the familiar definition of supply chain from farm to fork 
is being updated. It is not the same as we knew. Now, to make uh, a very, very long story short, it is practically a matter of supply and demand. Demand, as everybody knows, uh, maybe in this uh, forum, demand is going to grow since the world population is expected to reach 10 billion by 2050. Uh, and the way we grow and process our raw materials today is not effective. If we take meat as an example, for each calorie in our plate, we have to invest at least 19 calories in the breeding stage, not mentioning the extra energy required for processing and further until it reaches our dinner table, not mentioning the climate and the ethics and so on. So within the updated supply chain, um, we are talking about cultured uh, meat or alternative meat. Uh, and here we're talking about different supply chain. We, we are starting with a, a lab dish that uh, has a, a specific cell line inside. And at the end of the supply chain, we receive the meat alternative. Uh, another example for updated supply chain uh, is the fermentation technology that is also being adopted from the biotech industry. Uh, if we take as an example, um, Perfect Day, it's an American uh, California-based uh, startup uh, started in 2014. Um, with this technology of fermentation, they're actually able to skip the animal or the plant phase. They use microorganisms, food grade microorganisms in order to um, produce the proteins and uh, they make proteins of cow without the cow. Uh, and this specific company, Perfect Day, at July 2019, they, they sold their first prototype ice cream within hours it, online and they, they accomplished all, uh, all the ice cream. And recently, on May 2020, they got FDA approval for the whey proteins as grass material. So uh, it's happening. Now, if we are talking about updated uh, supply chain, of course, at the end, there are the consumers. Um, the consumers, they have their own concepts and their opinions, and they are looking for different and improved food choices. They are aware today to the health and wellness, sustainability, ethics, animal welfare, and of course, they are looking also for transparency. Now, um, in the field of waste reduction, um, it depends how you count it, <laughs> but about 50% of the farming output is not being consumed. And it happens to all the value chain. So I, I will give you some examples. Uh, fruits that are too small or don't have the perfect look are not, being, uh, are not even being collected. Um, although they can have an excellent test profile and highly nutritional value. In other uh, cases, only parts of the plants are being consumed or processed. And in more drastic situations, fish are being bred in order to extract a special pigment for the cosmetic and food uh, industries. Um, so if we are talking about waste reduction, there is a long way to go. But I can share with you that the global industry is there. There are advanced projects happening nowadays in the global big uh, uh, industries trying to mitigate this uh, waste reduction. One case study is the aquafava, which is the remaining water um, after we cook uh, uh, legumes. So it is actually being applied in many food uh, applications as egg white albumin replacement. Uh, and this is one uh, example. Uh, on your right, you can see a case study, a student uh, in my class of uh, new product development last year, they took the beer waste and uh, developed uh, rich uh, in protein and dietary fibers, crackers to, to eat beside the beer. It's a kind of holistic uh, case study. 
Um, and they also uh, developed uh, a design for beer cases and uh, glass bottles. If we are talking about food safety, so globally, every year, about 400,000 people die and about 600 million people fall ill after eating contaminated food. So, and, and the optional uh, contamination sources are bacteria, virus, parasites, and chemicals. Um, and the, it happens through all the value chain from the raw material through production, distribution, storage, and during preparation, of course. And here also, um, if we want to talk about current challenges, there is the growing demand and the climate changes and the industry is global and the risks are, are getting uh, uh, increased and increased, more big and big. Uh, here again, I, I must mention the utilization of big data and, and AI uh, through all the value chain in order to improve the safety, of course, and also the, the utilization of big data and AI could help us to minimize the use of pesticides and antibiotics which could also uh, uh, be harmful themselves. And next generation a sustainable solution include purifying production environment, working surfaces treatment, and I saw one of my colleagues here is going to talk about it, uh, so I will not. Uh, and also shortening the time of QC quality control tests, in, especially important in, sh in short shelf life products, such as fresh cuts, meats, uh, dairy products, and so on. Um, this is it uh, on a nutshell. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. I invite people from the audience to raise a question or two before we move on to our next speaker. Okay. Do we have anyone on the line? They can also approach me later on. It's okay. Wonderful. So um, kind of continuing from what Tommy mentioned about food waste and maybe um, losing the undesirable fruit or fish or meat um, because us consumers um, eat with our eyes, our next speakers are pioneers. Yeah, she she Everyone, George, can you uh, can you mute everyone? So, all right. So, our next speakers are pioneers of a unique food sharing concept. Robin Food NGO is a sustainability and food waste prevention initiative, starting from the first food rescue restaurant and now developing a marketplace for food surplus between consumers and organizations across the supply chain. Nick Shari, we are eager to learn more. Please share your screen with us. Yes, can you hear me? Wonderful. So, uh, thank you for the introduction and the kind words. Uh, I, I'm Nick Shari from uh, Robin Food. Uh, before I will start, I want to show you a video of our CEO and uh, co founder, Shai Rilov, who is unfortunately today could not be here only because he has a little minor. A uh, thing which is more important than being here, and it's his wedding day. Uh, so we made a special uh, video uh, for the occasion. I will be sharing the screen of the video, and then I will continue with a short PowerPoint. Hi, my name is Shai Rilov, co-founder and CEO of Robin Food NGO. I've come to see the social, environmental, and economic fields as part of one interdependent web, 
which can be seen through the lens of sustainability. While our resources are depleting and our carbon footprint is endangering humanity's survival, and a culture of insatiable consumption feeds the goal of infinite economic growth in a finite planet, food waste is perhaps the most ridiculous problem that humanity has, a prime issue that must be addressed and changed dramatically. If food waste was a country, it would be the third largest carbon emitter on the planet after China and the US. We produce enough food on the planet to feed every single person, and even more. Yet more than 800 million live in food insecurity. Under current trends, global food production will need to increase by 60% by 2050, which is near impossible if we don't address how we eat today. If all that doesn't blow your mind, here's one more taste of the food waste scandal. The global economic cost of food waste is around $750 billion. That's around the GDP of Switzerland. There are many approaches to address food waste. In the last five years, we've been raising food waste awareness by reaching people's hearts through their bellies. We established Israel's first restaurant based on rescued food. Fruits and vegetables that would otherwise be wasted from farms, markets, and shops with an ever-changing menu according to what was rescued. Each diner, lawyers, students, and homeless alike pay as they feel. That means each person decided the value of the food and the experience and could pay with their money, time, or skills. The operation was maintained by close to a thousand volunteers of all ages from around Israel and around the world to help expand our impact and also to support the operation. We were extensively covered by media in Israel and around the world and the subject of an award-winning documentary. While we are an NGO, we see ourselves as a social impact venture and like a startup finding innovative solutions with agile execution together with the community. We are now transitioning into the next stage of our impact, developing a food sharing app with a holistic approach, which helps prevent waste through the whole food chain for consumers and businesses alike. And now I will share the presentation again. Hope everyone could see the video in a good quality and enjoyed it. Fantastic video. Thank you. Okay, so uh, one second, I will uh, make another part disappear so you will see the everything in a good way. Okay, so I would like to share with you, first of all, our mission statement and our vision, uh, which is to open an accessible door for all to achieve a more sustainable lifestyle while saving money and connecting to your local community by making the sharing economy a community venture. So after Shai, Manuel, and Tammy, there is no need to elaborate any more about the problem of food waste. But uh, please let me take you uh, just for one local uh, piece of information uh, about the social problem uh, part of the food waste. And this is the 100% increase in the food donation demand in Israel alone, while one third of the food waste happens in the household level. So why we think we are the one who can really make the difference. Uh, after five years of uh, working together with the community and uh, making uh, and being part of the movement for food waste in Israel, uh, we bring the practice and the infrastructure to take it to the next level. And the next level is the Robin Food app. It's a platform which is a one-stop shop for food sharing and sustainability. The main functions uh, which I uh, want to share with you is uh, the C2C, uh, consumer to consumer surplus sharing, free of charge for both sides. The one who share and the one who uh, rescue the food. The second is the D2C, direct to consumer. We provide a channel for the manufacturers and suppliers uh, to give, uh, to sell their surplus and short-term products uh, for a discounted price. The next one is the B2B, which is a marketplace for large amounts of surplus 
or short terms, either for hotels or retirement houses or any other business or social business who know to deal with big amounts uh, and want to save some money. The last is again, giving back to the community, the B2 NGO model, which is rescue, how we call the, the food that is nearly wasted and give it to the community through the NGOs and the organizations uh, in the infrastructure of the unique marketplace. Uh, the B2B is also part of the, the revenue model to make all this uh, process work and fund. So when we talk about businesses and organizations, uh, we talk about the whole value chain from farms, producers, suppliers, retailers, caterers, restaurants, and of course, the consumer. Uh, the value we, we bring to the businesses is, first of all, a smart use of the surplus, uh, be able to reduce the loss of the sales. In uh, Israel alone, the numbers is between 2% and 6% of loss, uh, money value loss for the producers and the retailers. Access to the most relevant consumer for surplus which is one of our uniqueness that we provide in the platform. And of course, the social environmental recognition and the SDG goals, which are the goals we promoting and we give the businesses the opportunity to promote as well. Value for consumer is uh, one second before I continue, I just want to make sure you're still hearing me because I don't know if the share the screen is still sharing. So can anyone mark me that you still hear me? When I'm in the sharing mode? Yeah, okay, thank you. I don't see any videos of, or anyone else. So I'm going back to the presentation. So I was talking about the value we bring to the consumers. We give them the opportunity to reduce the waste, the one third that I was talking about in the household level, the reducing the food cost. Manuel before said that money is what the consumer understand and speak. And we able to give them the option to save money, not only save the planet, the ability to connect to the neighbors and give back to the local community as today during the post pandemic, uh, period we are living in is much more important because we understood that it's not uh, someone else who needs it can be our neighbor it can be you it can be us uh, another thing is the tips and the tools and the info we bring to the consumer about the food waste issue and about all the environmental things that can interest him and the last thing is to become a food rescue hero because our main approach is that the people who rescue the food, who share the food or collect the food are not the needy, are not the 18% the uh, who live in uh, food insecurity. It's for everyone uh, and the one who do it are the heroes who make the change. So uh, during the years uh, and now we worked with many partners and supporters, which we are grateful for. The team uh, first and uh, before everything is the huge community of Robin Food and the volunteers. We have a big team of hands on volunteers from the tech industry and from any other industries who are relevant for us to promote this and uh, we are grateful for their help uh, to bring uh, the solution and uh, what Robin Food brings to the community. And where we are now. So in the next quarter, we are releasing the beta version 
and starting a local pilot community. What's happening in the same time is that we are establishing a connection with major food industry actors in Israel uh, and uh, building with them all the infrastructure for the D2C, B2B, B2N geo levels. Uh, preparing for seed funding and impact investments and our vision after the local beta site in uh, Israel, which is the best place to have a beta site, is a global reach and global connections. So thank you for listening. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions or meet with any of you tomorrow. Thank you, Nick. Um, Nick will actually be continuing to the food waste breakout room, so you can catch up with him then. Or as he said, we do have a meeting day for all companies. Everybody presenting today will be available for meetings tomorrow. I have, ch I have uh, shared via the chat a link to register for one-on-one -on -one meetings for tomorrow. Up next, as we conclude our main session, we have our three breakout sessions led by industry specialist in the food waste room we have alexa Cadley, zero waste specialist from san francisco environment city of san francisco in the supply chain room we have walt deflock executive innovation leader at thrive EgTech usa and then we have jonathan berger ceo of the kitchen innovation hub by the strauss group israel um, in each room, you'll have the presenting company. You have all selected your room in advance. Once we break out to the rooms, after the room session ends, that would conclude our sessions. You will all be receiving recording of each of the sessions. And of course, I invite you to connect with the companies or request an introduction to any of our speakers today. It has been a pleasure being with you here today. And I wish you a fruitful session in the breakout rooms. You will Thank all you, Ray. Link quite fast. Thanks. Second. All right. We'll see you in the breakout rooms. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, if everyone's ready, we could just start off with Contgard and Oren Basili. I will give you the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so let me just share my screen. So let me know if you see the screen because I don't see uh oh. not yet. Oren, sorry to interrupt you. Before you begin presenting, I want to give the floor to Walt to give us the intros. Mm, okay. Oh no problem. Thanks, George. Yeah, no, um I think it's great to start with the, the company straight away. So if you I, I don't see your screen yet, uh Oren. But um, yeah, I thought, the, I thought the general session was great. Um, we've got plenty to talk about with supply chain. We'll start with uh, the companies and then we'll dive into a more general discussion. Okay, so Good. can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, basically in this uh, supply chain segment, our uh, main uh, uh, mission here is to have a cargo monitoring and to have a data anal anal analysis and analytics. Uh, and this is our main uh, concern regarding this uh, section. Of course, the, the, the food industry is one segment uh, among other segments that we support. Um, so let's start with the problem. Um, if you can see it, the main problem today is what we call the black hole, is about 70% uh, of all goods are in transit at all times. Uh, and this means that uh, we have a lot of uh, handoffs touching the, the containers, uh, the marine time container or the trucks uh, all around the world uh, with the high potential of different kind of uh, security uh, issues, uh, uh, quality issues, and of course, uh, supply chain uh, uh, deficiencies. 
according to the FBI report, about 55 billions uh, are in direct losses and about more than four times or maybe 10 times uh, are in indirect losses. Uh, so uh, the main issue here is the 100% uncertainty of what happens with, uh, with the cargo, with the goods in transit, regarding no visibility, uh, don't have any kind of uh, cargo quality and risk issues, of course, uh, lack of uh, schedules, uh, ETA, potential ETA, estimated ETA, uh, and no contingency planning issues. So basically, what, what is going on, what we do, we are a solution provider of both real-time uh, monitoring and post-shipment analysis of this good in transit. Um, our main issue here is we're using IoT devices, uh, tracking devices which we, which we attach to the cargo. Uh, and this uh, uh, IoT device, this cargo actually uh, uh, collects an enormous amount of data that we uh, uh, collect into our databases and we uh, activated a very sophisticated algorithms in order to provide uh, very uh, meaningful and valuable and actionable insights. Uh, and this is very important because this is a first-hand data. This is not a third-party or third-part uh, uh, data which is not on our control. We control on the data 100% of the time. Uh, and using our, uh, this information, you can both mitigate risk, you can improve, you know, of course, the business decisions, and uh, of course, you can optimize uh, all the supply chain processes. You, as you can see, our uh, partnership and ecosystem is starting from uh, AXA Ventures, City, City Ventures, AXA, and uh, a VC in Israel named uh, Canaan Partners. So how do we do this? Basically, uh, we provide the IoT devices, the tracking devices, uh, which you can see in this slide. Each uh, tracking device is, is, uh, is according to the customer needs, whether it's a, a dry container, it's a loose cargo, or any kind of a reefer container. Uh, we actually hand this and, and, and provide it to the customer. The customer does not have to buy it, lease it, or, man or maintain it. Uh, so we have all the logistics and the reverse logistic issues. Um, we provide, as I said, the live, live shipping analysis. If there's any kind of uh, an issue, we have a security center 24-7, uh, which we can notify our customers whether there's some kind of deviation from route, any kind of uh, safety issues, stolen goods, any kind of uh, uh, quality issues regarding temperature or, uh, or humidity or impacts. And of course, we have the, the, the analytics, which is the post shipping, which actually converge a lot of shipments, uh, thousands of shipments, we can, and we can provide the very uh, uh, meaningful and valuable insights. Uh, we have what we call a GON, which is uh, uh, our uh, partners all around the world. We support about 100 countries, and we have a life assistant in the native uh, language uh, all around uh, those countries. Uh, so here is the, the main, uh, the key benefit that, we, as, as I said, that we provide, which is security, uh, quality, and different kind of uh, uh, supply chain, ETA, uh, inventory efficiencies, and, uh, and of course, all of these are supported, the, the business grows. So this is one part of the logistic uh, side. Uh, all of this together is being presented in what we call a CGI platform, which is a uh, uh, an exception-based uh, platform which we present all the live and the post-shipment uh, uh, insights in a very, uh, very neat and very uh, uh, easy to understand uh, map view. Uh, here you can see uh, one uh, uh, shipment uh, which is going from Italy to Japan so we can present uh, the, the route and different kind of, uh, of uh, events that we uh, collected. This is with the, the real time. Here we can, uh, we monitor the no open event, which is a suspected uh, theft issue. We present the location and the time of this specific event. Um, here we can uh, uh, present you an impact, strong impact event. Again, we can uh, uh, know the exact location and what is the, uh, uh, the issue that we encountered. This is with the real time. With the post shipment is uh, uh, actually can present it in a few ways, but here we present it in a, a route uh, manner. So we can see here we collected a lot of shipments uh, and we uh, present the different kind of exceptions that we uh, collected. We have different kind of statistic measurements. 
uh, we present here, you know, according to the filters and any kind of uh, uh, data manipulation, we can present um, uh, the different uh, location of those theft issues or humidity issues or impact issues. And this could be very uh, significant in order to, you know, uh, manage the supply chain uh, events. Uh, in addition, we have uh, what we call a stop view, which we can uh, monitor uh, the stop location of a truck, uh, if it's according to a protocol, uh, where it was uh, stopped, if it was any kind of uh, exceptions like uh, uh, door open in those locations uh, or any kind of issues. Everything here is presented with a map. Uh, everything is, is stored as it can be uh, uh, collected and manipulated later on. Uh, in order to optimize those uh, um, those processes. Uh, here we can see our main uh, uh, customers in different kind of verticals, tobacco, pharmaceutical, automotive, of course, food and security. Um, and uh, our current stage is uh, we're actually completed round A. We actually raised two and a half million dollars. We're just initiating a round B and we're looking for about between five to $10 million. So this is very, very, very quick. I hope that I was able to condense everything in, uh, you know, in this limited time. And if you have questions. Uh... All right, well, thanks. It's, uh, there was a lot of great information. We have time mm -hmm. for one quick question before we jump to the next uh, presentation. I have a quick question. Are there any plans to implement this technology in small parcel? I'm based in the States. And I don't know how much you know about the challenges USPS is having. And as a small business, it's impossible to track. So just wondering if you had any goals to go even smaller. We have, uh, you know, the, what we call the loose, as you can see here, the loose cargo, uh, this one the, in the middle. Right. So we can uh, implement it in any kind of, uh, you know, loose package, depending of, of your exact requirements. But this uh, has, a, you know, uh, in addition to all of this, it has a significant uh, battery management. So it's not limited to every few days or few weeks. It can last for more than three months. So depending okay. on your... Like an inch? Uh, this is about uh, um, four inches, something like this. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Oren. Next up, we've got Rapid Farm, and I see Gil is on. And um, you can share your screen when you're ready. Hi, uh, hi everybody. Uh, just one second. So <clears throat> thank you very much. Hope you can see my screen. Uh, basically, we are a farm, farm management software provided with uh, an online uh, market place for uh, fresh farm and produce. Our uh, mission statement is to allow farmers to increase sales by improving the production chain management and to sell online directly to a local customer. I will try to explain how we combine those two. Currently, uh, we've been working uh, with farmers for more than a year now. We have more than 170 farms in the US and Canada that are using the system and, and some big farms in Africa also. Uh, we have a farm base in uh, Kentucky with uh, strong support from local farmers. And uh, now we're looking for a partner and investor or both to increase our US footprint and to launch the e-commerce program that is already operating, but uh, in order to launch it properly we need some more farm. I know this is a very uh, complex uh, uh, slide, but I will try to explain. Uh, I think it's important just to understand the scope of what we are doing. Uh, we call it from seed to sales. So basically uh, our system or uh, the farmer can, can manage everything from the purchase, uh, inventory, cost, uh, how much uh, products he has, uh, on his farm uh, on any given time, uh, what, what is the cost, uh, how much uh, fertilizer he's been using, uh, either uh, directly or by, uh, in, in, inside the irrigation, and also the irrigation itself. Uh, each plot or greenhouse or plantation uh, has its own uh, data, data page, and everything has been uh, controlled uh, from the nursery stage uh, after the harvest of it, our harvest of course, and while, while all the crop is going to the storage. 
the interesting part, and, and above that, above that, there is more tools uh, to, for HR management, task management, everything. So basically, this is a, an ERP, a full ERP system in that in that regard. It, it uh, starts to uh, be interesting <clears throat> when we are moving to the, the sales. So the farmers uh, or it can be either a medium farm or a big farm. He knows exactly how much uh, crop he has uh, in his inventory at any given time, and he can uh, uh, share with that, share that with the retailers and uh, offer that and accept the orders. Or he can sell via our uh, e-commerce platform, uh, uh, what we call a, a fashion uh, local. And the idea is to allow a local customer to uh, to view at any given time all the farms in their area that are selling fresh produce uh, and, and to sell all the transaction goes through us uh, and I will explain it in a second. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, the, the sales is being supported either by the, the fact that we are uh, allowing the farmers to establish their own online store or to sell via our own uh, portal uh, and to uh, manage everything invoices, and transaction, payment, income, and everything on one, uh, one platform. Uh, we know for sure in our uh, connection with farmers that uh, they have solution, but it's very divided and it's not uh, organized in one, one place. Uh, the issue of the e-commerce is uh, we try to make it as simple as possible. And uh, basically the farmer, they list their products on their uh, on, their, uh, uh, on the platform, uh, this is what the, the customer can see. And uh, after that, uh, they can uh, uh, issue an orders. Uh, the farmer get notified. And uh, last night, delivery vendor that we're working with uh, pick the uh, pick the order, and it can be from multiple multiple farms and deliver it to the customer. Just a couple of uh, screenshots. I don't have time to go over the system. This is a, an example of uh, some of the uh, picture of the, the way they control. Everything is very easy and uh, easy to use. And uh, the, car, the, the farmer uh, feedback is, is quite uh, positive on that. And this is the, the way, sorry for the, the blur picture, but uh, this is the way the, uh, the the e-commerce uh, platform looks like uh, and basically I think this is I try to squeeze everything into the five minutes I had. If there is uh, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Great, Gil. Thank you. Yeah, we have time for a quick question before we go to the next presentation. If anyone has a question for Gil. Okay, and I wanted to remind everybody, as Ray mentioned, we've got the link in the chat. If anybody wants to set up a deeper conversation with any of the companies for tomorrow, uh, that link is available uh, and you guys can get one-on-one -on -one and go as deep as you want to go. Uh, I have a quick, quick, quick question if we have time. Please. Um, what is the price setting mechanism and the commerce mechanism that you use? You're talking about how long? price or the way we charge uh, the farmers. We charge the farmers for a subscription and uh, we charge- No, what is, the, how do you set the transaction price? The question about the transaction price. Okay, basically the farmer sets the price of products and we charge 12% of the transaction. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, next up we have Step Back and we have uh, I hope I'm not butchering the name, Ronnie. Yeah, uh, I'm sending perfect. Okay, perfect. We are ready when you want to share your screen out. Thank you very much, Walt. Hi, everyone. My name is Ronnie Kadosh, and I'm from Stepak. Um, let me share my screen. Let me know if you can see. Yes, we can. Okay. So uh, a few words to introduce uh, the company and uh, the technology. Uh, 
a second, I think it's going slow. Now it's full screen. Yes, just, uh, just running slow between one slide to another. So Stepak is a part of uh, uh, Johnson Nutty, uh, our mother company, which is based uh, in the UK, founded in 1992. We are focusing on modify atmosphere, modify humidity packaging to extend shelf life of fresh produce, reduce waste in the supply chain, uh, enhance uh, the quality and the lifetime of the fruit and vegetables and in the long uh, on the longer term to also, of course, uh, increase, improve the consumer experience, able to uh, eat a better fresh fruit and vegetable, and not throwing part of it uh, to the waste. So we have uh, uh, complementary first harvest uh, technologies. We have the free granted the patents. Uh, we are uh, located, uh, the headquarters in, is in Israel. R&D in Israel, in the UK, and we have a pretty wide network uh, all around the world, which enable us to control and to assist uh, our customers, both on the origin, but also on the destination market. And we are involved in a lot of transactions of uh, food, um, fruit and vegetables, which are shipped from one continent to another using our technology to pack the fruit and vegetables. So um, the idea of the modified atmosphere, modified humidity technology in a nutshell is to like put the fruit uh, into a coma. We elevate CO2, we lower oxygen up to the point where we call it the sweet point, where the produce inside breathes slower and respires slower. And that's obviously maintaining and extending the shelf life of the produce. Um, and it goes hand by hand with uh, the cool chain, which is very important to support our technology. So whoever use our modified atmosphere packaging has to maintain a cool chain all along the journey uh, to get the utmost out of our technology. There are different formats. The traditional format is what we call the bulk. And the, this, for example, I'm based in San Diego um, and I'm in charge of the activity in the North America market. So we uh, sell this bag to many of the growers in Mexico, which are exporting their produce into the US. So that's one format, the bulk. Um, we have a patent for iceless packaging um, and that's uh, eliminate the ice from, uh, from the inside of the packaging and reducing the risk for contamination because of using ice. It's much more efficient in terms of logistics um, in space. And of course, it's uh, extending the shelf life as the rest of our technologies. Um, another format could be the top seal leading film, which is becoming very popular these days. Also standing pouches, um, format for flow pack. So our film could be also adaptable to machinery, uh, whether it's a vertical or, or horizontal uh, flow pack. And could be also in a format or a pre of a preform bag, which could be packed by hand manually if there is not machine involved. We serve different um, customers from all the supply um, from all the supply chain range. It could be growers, it could be distributors, it could be importers, it could be packaging companies, and it could be retailers. So um, we we touch uh, a, a, whenever we are selling our technology. We look at ourselves not only as a packaging manufacturer, but uh, but as a consultant and as a holistic approach to really support our customers all the way through the supply chain to make sure that everyone understands how to use the technology and what are the benefits for them. So in other words, we have to convince all the supply chain to use our technology in order to make it work. 
So again, um, the application expertise is reducing the waste, um, and that's uh, relevant obviously both to the food waste, but also to the supply chain, because in many cases, what we are able to, uh, to achieve uh, with our technology and our customers is uh, shifting a lot of uh, the transactions of fruit and vegetables uh, in the continent or between continent um, from freight, for example, to sea freight. By doing that, we save a lot of uh, waste, but also save a lot of uh, carbon footprint. So uh, that's the main uh, idea. We handle the post harvest and the protocols and all the troubleshooting uh, that relevant for the process of the validation and the process of uh, making uh, our packaging work in a very good way. We have a laboratories um, in R&D centers uh, in Israel, in the UK, and also in South America, in Brazil, where we are testing, uh, um, we are testing all the different uh, produce types and different packaging formats that uh, we apply. Every packaging that we develop is tailor-made. Um, and you can imagine that the respiration rate of a uh, cucumber is different than an eggplant and is different than melon. And also it's depend of um, what's the size of the package and how much fruit or vegetable packed inside, whether it's a uh, one kilogram, two kilogram or five kilogram, everything make a difference for the specific, um, uh, specific per micro, micro perforation that we do on the bag uh, to, to uh, control the gas inside, the gas regime, and also the type of the nylon we're using to be able to control the modified humidity. As I mentioned before, uh, we are active in 60 countries and we have reps in 23 countries um, that give us the ability to help our customers on both the origin and the destination. And that's a very critical part. It's not only um, selling the bag to a customer in one continent, it's also to make sure how the product arrived and giving him the feedback, how, how did it uh, arrive and what needs to be changed or improved in order to make it work better. So we give this service to all of our customers. At the end of the day, uh, what you can achieve by using uh, Stepak Extend technology is a better quality of, uh, for the customer, a reduction of the carbon uh, footprint, as I mentioned, when you are shipping sea versus uh, air freight, uh, waste reduction in the supply chain, and you can also use the technology for season extension. Many of our customers are storing fresh produce within our packaging and trying to maintain the fruit for longer and trying to capture a better deal in the market um, where they can sell it in a higher price. So that's another advantage. The last packaging products helped to successfully deliver 540,000 tons of fresh produce around the globe, helping to prevent 50,000 tons of waste. This is something that obviously we are very proud of and um, we look forward for any questions or any potential uh, meetings that will come from this event. And thank you very much. Okay, great, Ronnie. Well, we have time for one question before we get to our last company presentation. Does anybody have uh, a quick question before we uh, move on? Okay, no worries. And again, the link in the chat is to uh, set up one-on-one -on -one meetings for tomorrow. And I see Trellis is right on it. Excellent, good work. Uh, you have the floor. and we can see your screen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Fantastic. So thanks, Walt. Uh, my name is Eli Inglard. I'm the co-founder and CEO. Um, we all know how extreme heat waves affect grape maturity. Um, this has direct impact on harvest operations and winemaking economics. And helping wine country in California uh, to address such challenges is an example to what we do. Our mission as a company is to predict supply and demand behavior and resolve inefficiencies and deliver opportunities to optimize food production. We do that by using AI and machine intelligence. In the past three years, uh, we've been doing that uh, across the globe, dealing with enterprise customers at large scales in multiple verticals. And the main problem that we solve for our customers um, is that they come to us uh, with siloed and manual supply planning tools that really cannot keep up with the ever-changing environment. Um, an example for that is what happened during Corona. Um, Grace, Olive, Stan, Paul, people across the supply chain network uh, have been facing with uh, the challenge of changing the supply chains overnight. This is a nightmare and impossible to do with existing uh, IT infrastructure that uh, helps them manage the supply chain. And what we do is, is provide them and equip them with one platform that essentially supports live decisions throughout the supply chain and production cycles. And there are three main things that we do. So first, we, um, we deliver supply predictions, leveraging data from the enterprise systems, weather data, field information into one place for live predictions of yield, harvest timing, and crop quality. Secondly, we improve planning accuracy by delivering, it, delivering these actionable insights into supply and demand planning early in the season. And third, we optimize production to resolve inefficiencies and deliver opportunities to optimize food production and logistics. The main KPIs that we solve for are, first of all, uh, improving ingredient cost, usually by five to 10%. And the second one is production resource utilization, where resources could be tank capacities, labor, trucks, uh, inventory, all of that is, is things that we incorporate into our data sets and models, and uh, we use our predictions to optimize. Um, we have built a team with uh, extreme passion to build resilient food systems. A uh, company was founded in 2017, uh, HQ in Tel Aviv. Uh, we're deployed right now globally uh, in the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Israel. And uh, the vast majority of our team come with um, uh, experience in AI, machine learning, and supply chain. 25% of the company are PhD. Highly diverse team, uh, uh, people of experience, junior, uh, uh, and also gender. And um, we're really happy to partner with companies that want to leverage our experience to optimize their food production operation. Uh, as a company, we are now growing, hiring, raising money. So happy to, to collaborate and explore, explore synergies. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one question before we move to the general discussion. And again, reminder, the, uh, the link in the chat is for setting up one-on-ones with any of the companies for tomorrow. Um, going once, going twice, last chance for questions for Trellis. Okay. Well, thank you to the companies for those presentations. Uh, some really great technology. I like the level of innovation across so many areas. Um, and let's, let's begin with the general discussion on supply chain. So quick introduction. I am a fifth generation family farmer in the Salinas Valley. Um, 
and all that comes with California agriculture that many of you are familiar with. Uh, my sister and I have developed over 4,400 acres of irrigated farmland the last three decades. Um, I love to see the grape picture in Trellis. Uh, we've got 1,400 acres of wine grapes with Mondavi that we uh, developed about uh, 30 years ago. Uh, been a fantastic partnership. We've got 3,000 acres of specialty crops. Uh, as I say, when there's water and soil quality, we like to put uh, spinach and leafy greens into play. When there's not, we do carrots and potatoes. Um, and it's strictly a function of what kind of water and soil you end up with and where you're developing. I've also got 25 years at growth startups in Silicon Valley, uh, including eBay, which you've heard of, two others you haven't, but they did get to the finish line and get acquired uh, over the last several years, which was nice. Um, and I've been building the number one agri-food tech accelerator at Thrive the last couple of years uh, and working with corporate innovation partners like Driscoll's Berries on helping them work with startups better and faster. Uh, and I currently, I'm a very active uh, writer. I write a weekly newsletter called Agri-Food Tech Alchemy on Medium that focuses, no surprise, on agri-food tech innovation. So I'm passionate about the space. I love what you guys are up to. I'm a big startup evangelist and advocate. And um, I think this is just a perfect topic for it. Uh, so supply chain, you guys have heard a lot about what's going on. COVID ruined a whole lot of The, the st streaming is a bit breaking. Is it only me? Yeah, I think he may have disconnected. Yeah, I can't see either. Okay, thanks. So I just sent Walt a message. So hopefully he can um, dial back in. So just in case Walt is not able to rejoin us, um, he is an advisor for Thrive Accelerator. Um, and I'm just going to, to paste his LinkedIn here. I'm sure you can find it, but he's an incredible person and thought leader here in, in, in California. And he's available to meet with any of you um, and, and chat with you in the future. So. I'm just going to paste the link and I think that he probably is not going to be able to join. He's already left. Let's see. So what what's what's next? Laura, you want to take over? Yeah, so I think we're actually um, we're actually wrapping up now. Um, and so for those of you who would like to set up meetings, please do so. For people who have registered for the event today that um, either joined other sessions or were not able to join the plenary session, um, we're going to send them the link as well. And then for the breakout sessions, since we've recorded all of them, we'll be posting them to the Global SF website so that we can keep the conversation going and have this ongoing connection, if that's okay with all of you. Um, so that if companies who are not able to join um, watch the presentations later on, then they can connect with you uh, through the Israeli uh, trade mission. Amazing. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's been incredible you to hear what you're what you're building. Um, so let's keep the partnership strong.
Thanks, Laura. Keep safe. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.